Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. My guest today is Dr. Matthew Burke, and Matthew is the founder and director of Optimal Health Essentials. Matthew specializes in chiropractic, in applied kinesiology, neuroemotional technique, neurolinguistic programming, positive psychology, peak performance, functional bio- biochemistry, and a breath enhancement training. He has worked in Europe and Australia and studied Vedic philosophy and meditation in India. We talk a lot about memory, the memory that is kept in your muscles and nerves and ultimately your brain and the impact those memories have on your health, how you recover from injury or illness, mental or physical. Matthew's passions in life are his family, the ocean, snow-capped mountains and helping people realise the potential. I have been really looking forward to talking with Matthew for some time and sharing his knowledge and experience with you, my dear listener. So, I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Matthew Burke. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Thank you, Ron. Pleasure to be here. Matthew, we were on a panel uh, together uh, a few weeks or a month or so ago, and it just struck me when I listened to your answers and and looked at your background that we actually had a lot in common coming at it from a very different perspective. Now, you know, there's so much we're going to talk about because you've got a lot of really interesting skills. But, um, you know, I thought as a chiropractor, you might just give our listener a little bit of your own journey, uh, you know, from the moment you kind of graduated to, um, to this point in time, but also to remind us of what the difference is really between a chiropractor, an osteopath, a physiotherapist. So I wonder if you might share a bit of that with our listener. Yeah, sure. Um, I was kind of lucky in my life um, on the journey of finding my path in that I, you know, I was pretty, I was very much into my sports when I was young and into surfing a lot. And I had um, a recurrent low back issue that started to happen. And, um, and a friend of the family was a was a chiropractor, and um, I went and saw him, and he practiced a technique called sacrooccipital technique, and um, and I was just always sort of in awe at the way in which I could walk in in one state and walk out in another with him only using his hands, and in what seemed to be an incredibly short amount of time, and um, and how the problem never seemed to be where I thought it was. You know, he would always he'd adjust something down my skull and my back pain would go away or he'd fix something in my foot and it'd correct my knee pain and and I was just fascinated by that. And then I ended up doing work experience with him um and and in year ten and the more I watched it the more I just thought it was one of the most incredible things to observe and experience. So um that sort of sparked my interest and um and then yeah, then I went to uni and and uh, went to medical science at Sydney first. And um, at that stage, there was no sort of uh, undergraduate chiropractic uh, process that there is at, um, uh, at Macquarie now. And so I, I was doing the medical science at Sydney and then um, some chiropractic courses at night before you go into the Masters of Chiropractic program in the final two years. So I kind of got to experience that with all the other people doing medical science, which are going into medicine and, and dent, dentistry and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, you know, part of me egoically was getting pulled in the direction of, well, maybe I should go and be a doctor or, um, you know, do surgery or something like that. And there was, there was just no, it was never a compelling pull to do that sort of thing. Cause I loved the style of work that I'd been exposed to and using the body to heal itself and, um, and working with health and not disease, or just all those sort of principles really appealed to me. So, yeah, so that was my journey through that that process and and how I found it in the first place. And you know, and I, and I was fortunate to to finish uni and then um and start work in a really successful practice. In fact, they went away and gave me the keys to their practice and went to to Canada for a month. And that was my first day of work, and I ended up having seeing something like 250 people in my first week when I, that was where I'd gone from being at uni undergrad, seeing five people a week. So <laughs> it was this massive growth curve in how you manage people and stay focused and manage flow and, and, um, and communicate effectively. And, um, and it was, it was huge, but 
you know, six months into that um, associate uh, position, and my goal was always to work for two years and then go to Europe and go skiing, do a ski season, and this had been my sort of vision since I was kind of 14. And and, um, and six months into it, I got this severe SI pain, sacroiliac joint pain, um, that I had trouble walking with and then couldn't run and then couldn't do sport. And then then it swapped to the other side and and um, and... And then I was seeing all these chiros and various other practitioners and no one could get to the bottom of it. And then one night I was rolling in bed and, and the SI joint kind of just was cracking and falling all over the place. It feels so unstable. And I was like, this is not a physical problem. This is something more complex. And um, and then I went and did all my own tests and ended up finding out that I had uh, an autoimmune condition, that uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, which, which from my uni understanding was pretty intense. And uh, and I was like, okay, well, you know, it looks like my physical life as I know it is about to finish because I was certainly, um, what, what I studied about that, it wasn't a very good prognosis. And um, so, yeah, and then I, um, I, you know, I went and saw a rheumatologist and, they, this they, was they Matt, this was how long into how how far after you graduated was this? This was like six months. In that first six to twelve months, it, the symptoms started, yep. and by yep. by the twelve month mark, I was struggling to hold myself against gravity. I was still working because I was, you know, a pretty wow. determined person, and um, and but I couldn't run and I couldn't surf and I couldn't do any sport and uh, and and uh, you know I was. I was 25 and sit and at that stage of my life felt relatively invincible you know I was yeah. um, so this was an auto weird. an autoimmune condition the diagnosis being a spond you mentioned spondylitis An- ankylosing spondylitis ankylosing. yeah which is a, 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 a inflammatory arthritis that tends to affect the spine um, primarily and then um, and it results in fusion of the spine you know it's, it's wow. the end stage of it uh, and it tends to progress up the spine and can, uh, but can affect peripheral joints as well. Um, uh, yeah, and it certainly was in a, a, a very painful stage. And, and you know, because it, it's an autoimmune and it's an inflammatory condition, it tends to, one of the hardest things is just a burn in your back at night time and you're lying in bed and it's like someone's got a hot poker burning you, you know, and, and you just can't get comfortable and then you don't get enough sleep. And if you don't get enough sleep, then you, your adrenals start to get fatigued and then the whole thing just starts getting worse, you know, and you end up yeah. in that cycle of adrenal fatigue and um, and pain and then more pain and more less sleep. And, yeah, it's pretty pretty mm. uh, tough when you're in that zone. Um, so that was kind of pretty disappointing. And up until that stage of my life, everything had gone according to plan and um, and I was used to just sort of setting goals and achieving them and... and <laughs> And couldn't quite believe that that had happened. Didn't really understand the concept of the hero's journey at that point, but clearly I was on it, whether I liked it or not. And um, but anyway, I went away to Europe, and because um, I went, okay, I'm going to go no matter what, and I'll have fun whilst I can. And uh, yeah, it had up and down sort of phase when I was away. It, was in, it kind of got pretty bad, and then it would kind of be not too bad. But at one point, I ended up in Mykonos in the Greek islands, and. Um, and uh, and I got food poisoning, um, and didn't eat for a week, and then had to get up and run to a ferry, going to another island, and I could get up and run with a backpack on, and I hadn't done that for years, like for at least two years, and and um, and I was just so excited. I was like, oh my god, the freedom of movement and the freedom to bounce along and not have sharp stabbing pain, and um. And then it just occurred to me, I was like, you know, I'm not powerless in this condition. This condition is affected by what I eat and it's affected by my gut. And it was just this revelation. And uh, and this is kind of, you know, 25 years ago or 20, 23 Cause years I ago. Because I, I saw you a few weeks ago and you looked fabulous. So I, I gathered there was a happy ending <laughs> to this story because this is quite a shock for a 25-year-old to be diagnosed with a condition that is degenerative and very limiting, and here you were. Yeah. Here you were saved by an enforced seven-day fast. Yeah, you know, and and I was also told by my rheumatologist that diet has absolutely nothing to do with it. That there's nothing that I could do, and if I just took these drugs, that they would 
keep things at bay for a while. And I looked at those drugs and that was prednisone followed by, you know, methotrexate and uh, high levels of ibuprofen and then on to um, various other non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which quickly demolished my gut to the point where I, you know, I had blood in my stools and I just went, okay, I can't, obviously can't take this. And they stopped working. It was clearly diminishing returns very early on. Like within the first three months of attempting that as a solution, I was like, that's not a solution. This is absolutely exacerbating the problem. And um, and that became, then I really realized that once I went away and um, started fasting and went, okay, there's the answer. So I ended up doing a ski season uh, <laughs> in the French Alps. And uh, but having a few little flare-ups there because you know I, I hadn't quite worked out the dietary guidelines there, and obviously you can't fast you know the whole time. And um, so uh, then ended up going back by Thailand and did uh, a week of fasting and colonics and all that kind of stuff there, where you just clean your gut out and and take care of the liver. And then that kind of left me asymptomatic for a couple of years, and I got back and came back home, and my wife was pregnant and. You know, when we started a business and and uh, kicked off life in Sydney, and uh, you know, within two years we had eighteen staff and two businesses, and everything life was crazy. You know, <laughs> so, mm. because you children. do you do describe yourself as a functional uh, chiropractor, don't you? I mean, is that yeah? So then that sort of my my introduction to chiropractic as well was one in which I. Um, I'd been I'd looked at it at a, as a more holistic kind of thing, and I'd been exposed to a technique called neuroemotional technique, which is looking using muscle testing to identify the emotional driver of physical problems. Which again just blew me away how quick and effective that was at fixing something that I didn't even know I had, but then made so much sense when I was in it. And I was like, okay, here's how I created that, and again, really empowering. So. When I, I went, as I sort of fasted my, my, my gut and then came back home and had time to start to look at this more and investigate and then look at research and start to work out stuff about the microbiome, which definitely wasn't as popular in, in understanding as it is now. And, and um, But there was a few ideas on what was going on and I started to work out, you know, I couldn't have grains and I couldn't have sugar and I had a low starch diet. I was pretty good. But then I kind of worked out that if I had a perfect diet and got really stressed, it still came back anyway. So then I went down the road of doing any neuro-emotional technique and learning all of that and, and getting that done on myself and did that for quite a few years and had some pretty big big breakthroughs with how that was um, affecting my arthritis and then and using that clinically. And then I kind of you know could see that there was an overlying state of consciousness which brings up particular emotional patterns and you need to upgrade that whole level of consciousness as well. So then I sort of got into Vedic philosophy and meditation and those sorts of things to um, to gain some more insights at, at that level, which was again insightful and incredible. And then I could I found when I did that sort of work, then my diet was less important. Hmm. So kind of that was sort of the path to the you know to the functional chiropractic approach that I that I took. So everything I was learning was basically on those sort of tracks at the time. So initially a lot of biochemistry and um, nutrition and fasting and that sort of stuff followed by a lot of work around emotions and personality types and different patterns of mind body kind of things you know and, and neuro-linguistic programming and neuro-emotional technique and all those sorts of things and then into more of the daily practice of um of enhancing the mind, enhancing the body, and, and those sorts of things to just create that that resilience in the system. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. So that you know, with all, I think when you look at chiropractors and and osteopaths and and physiotherapists, there's a, there's a baseline kind of approach that's kind of applied to all those things. But every individual takes them on a certain journey, often to do with their own health journey <laughs> or whatever their values are. You know, some people it's about money, some people it's about health, some people it's about trying to fix someone they love. But it takes you on an individual journey, you know. So you can't say one physio, one osteo, one chiro. You know, they, they, you can't sort of apply that across the board to all the different practitioners. So certainly the chiropractic field that I'm in, which is more holistic chiropractic and, um, and, and, and integrative chiropractic, you're looking at it and it comes from that chiropractic philosophy, which is what we learned early on from the very foundational days of chiropractic was 
that healing is above, down, inside, out, that it comes from universal intelligence through in the innate intelligence of the body expressed through the nervous system and the body does the healing. It just needs to be free of interference, you know, and that's the basic premise of chiropractic. That's chiropractic philosophy 101. And it kind of got a little bit railroaded into this structural model of that interference is always at the spinal level. Um, and you can have what they call subluxations, which are when the spine is out of alignment and creating some sort of irritation to the neurology, which disrupts the flow of information from the brain to the body or the body back to the brain and therefore disrupting the body's organizational and adaptive capability. Mm. So, but really in reality, the, those it's not limited to physical things and in fact in this day and age the physical elements are much less because our stresses tend to be beyond the physical a lot of the time there there a lot of it is toxicity a lot of it is stress you know so Mm. um because people just aren't doing those physical jobs as much and their life is a lot more complex um and stressful so you know it's stress is the main thing that's causing that interference these days and so our practice is a lot more centered around giving, having tools for managing that mm. um, and improving resilience in people uh, on that level. Well, well, Matt, this is all music to our ears because this is what this program's about, and I love that. Above, down, inside, out. Above, down, inside, out. That's a really nice foundational idea and i know that stress is a big part of your practice stress management what do you say yeah. to, what do you say to people like you know when they say oh, i'm stressed i think my health is really affected where do you start where do you start people well i guess again the the, the key start is to is to really look at well ultimately life has no meaning except the meaning we give it and that stress is really a response by the body to the meaning you gave something. So you need to understand where those meanings come from. <laughs> and um, and so, you know, I think that's where applied kinesiology, neuroemotional technique is so powerful because it can just go, okay, I'm feeling frustrated about this because, and you find that because goes back to some other developmental stage of your life and your unconscious mind is generalizing this response to it, you know, and, um, and that you have choice around that. And you can't just let go of that emotion because it isn't really necessary. It's not going to help the situation. It's not serving a solution. And But it does need to be digested. It does need to be expressed and released in some form. So you need to have outlets for that and helping. You know, people just come in and their cup's full. You know, that is, they can't take another thing because they're, they're, they're so full of, of unresolved, stressful um, energy. You know, and I think... Basically, when stress stressful events happen to us, um, the that energy gets embedded at a cellular level, you know, and and it it can be expressed through exercise, through meditation, through talking things through sometimes. But ultimately, we might get ten units of stress in a particular situation, and we might express four units of it through various ways and through sleep and that kind of stuff, we start to, you know, build up this reserve of another six and that gets compounded by the next one and the next one and the next one and people go through, con- you know, complex life situations and then they get to that point where they they lose adaptation because that amount of energy is now the dominant um, uh, influence on their consciousness. It's, it's how they're ex- experiencing and projecting into reality and we know that reality is different for everyone and we know that... Um, you know, as you get older, you're no longer experiencing reality as it is, but you're projecting more into it based on your previous experience. Your body's predicting what reality is rather than fully absorbing it through your five senses. So if we have these strong beliefs and we have all this stress inside us, we start to project that into the reality that we have, we're having. And therefore, you know, those things tend to show up a lot more for us. So we really need tools for unpacking that kind of stuff out of people, getting them back to where the, the you don't need to fix everything that's ever happened. You just need to take that load off that's the overwhelming component. And then they have adapt, adaptation again. And then all of a sudden they can manage and make decisions and they're not in that overwhelm. Uh, and then they start to move forward. And then stress becomes wisdom and wisdom becomes meaning. And, you know, and they end up on, uh, you know, they're aware of the hero's journey and, they can look back and go, well, you know, I'm glad that happened to me because now I'm here, you know? So that's the goal. The goal is to acknowledge the perfection in all of it, but, 
you know, move about it in a functional way and less damaging to those around us. Mm. We take responsibility for mm-hmm. it. I mean, thank goodness we have an adaptive capacity. It's when when we don't anymore that things start really going wrong. You've mentioned neuro-emotional technique. You've mentioned neuro-linguistic programming and kinesiology. I wondered if we might just come back to that and give us a little bit of, uh, you know, someone walks into your practice and they've heard this term neuro-emotional technique, NET, NLP. Can we go 101? Let's just explain to our listener. I mean, you've you've touched on a few of these things already, but let's just give it a name. NET, neuro neuro emotional technique. Tell us. Yeah, so neuro emotional technique is kind of a a branch of applied kinesiology in a way. It's sort of built on those principles, and um, and what it is is the fact that when you when you test a muscle in the body, and it's not when you do so you do a muscle strength test, but it's not a test of how strong the muscle is. in total, it's just, it, you want to have, say you use the, the, the deltoid and you use it at, at, uh, at in, in 90 degree uh, flexion, you're looking for how well it can lock and be stable, you know? And what you find is that people can hold this beautiful control over that muscle, but if they say something that's not congruent, like they say, um, I'm okay with where my life is at now. If they're not okay with that at an unconscious level, that arm will be weaker. Okay, you know, about 20% weaker, just loses that ability to be stable. Um, and it's really quite obvious. And it, or if they think of something that stresses them, like say, you know, think of, you know, um, someone you have a grievance with, you know, and you think of them, you go weak. And it represents how your body responds to stress. It just weakens the system temporarily. Um, and what happens in that system is it tends to be a binary system. So if you, if you go weak to something, if you find something that relates to it, it will go strong again. So, uh, and this is where we start to use the meridian system. So from Chinese medicine and that oriental uh, five element theory, you might think of you know, a person you had a grievance with, say your wife, and you go, you think of her name and, you, and, and as you're thinking that name, your body's going weak and you come around and you find the meridian access point of the liver and the, the body goes strong to that. And you go, okay, so that person relates to this particular meridian in, in your system. This is where the, the, the energetic correlation is. Now, that the liver then uh, relates to key emotions, usually around the theme of injustice. So something that wasn't fair or, you know, uh, will hurt you in some way like that. So, so therefore, the primary emotion is anger. But it could also be resentment or frustration. It could be aggression, those sorts of things. So you just test semantically through through using, you know, just saying those words. The body will respond to the semantics, which is fascinating. So um, with that, you can help to map that out. So you would you would have the subject being, say, your wife, and then the emotion, which might be frustration, and then you just have to ask the person, okay, how would you put? your wife and frustration together you know, together in a sentence that makes some sense to you. Um, and then what that does is it opens up the, the Google inside you, right? <laughs> this incredible search engine that we have with focused intent to, to look at what the correlation is there. And so something very clear pops into your mind generally. It will just go, boom, it's this, you know? I feel frustrated because... And once we understand what that because is, then we can, then we just take that out and generalize a little bit. I feel frustrated because um, of this, you know, when, when she does this, uh, it, it means that um, I can't do this thing that I want to do. It affects my freedom. Okay. So when, when, when my wife says this to me, I feel frustrated because I don't have the freedom to do this in my life. Um, so, then we just look for, let's check for an original time or event in which there was frustration because of someone's control over your freedom, okay, or someone's perceived control over your freedom. And then an amazing thing the body does when you're using the, the mind in this way is you can index for time. So you can say conception to five, five to 10, 10 to 15, and it will come you're up. You're talking years. A, you're talking years. In years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, these, these sort of blocks of time and you can narrow it down to a year, you know, 
um, or closely, depending on where you, what you're doing with someone. And then, um, then he says, so what was, where were you? What were you doing around this time? And again, that just allows the search engine of the mind to go, oh yeah, this is when, you know, I really wanted to do this in my life, but my mom just wouldn't let me because she spoke to me in this way and said I couldn't do this and she wanted me to do this. You know, and so there was this feeling of that was unfair because my brother got to do that, but now I wasn't allowed to. And there's this whole story that exists in there and this whole pattern of frustration that is now showing up in a primary relationship. But really, it started when you were seven, you know, Mm. and if you look along that timeline, there's been lots of other kind of situations that looked like that as well. But when you go back to the original event and you let go of the energy at that point, it tends to clear the other things along that timeline. And, uh, and the body will have a physiological re- release to that. So what you commonly see, especially with anger and those sort of emotions, is a lot of heat comes out of the body. As soon as you hit that primary thing, they remember it. They can become emotional. Um, a lot of heat just comes out. They start to sweat. And that's the energy being released from that cellular level. You can map that through the body. Like key muscles will switch on as a result of clearing an emotional pattern. Um, and things change very, very quickly in, in, with that sort of approach. So that's a that's a key way in which um, you mm-hmm. know a key technique for really addressing stress at a very specific level. You know, to to really find out where the unresolved issue is and where it came from and why. Yeah, I mean, I've seen uh, practitioners use this, and I and I, I I always approach these things with a really open mind, and and I think that it's interesting because. Um, you know, we often hear the things muscles have memory and that memory yeah. can go a lifetime. Well, of course, those muscles attach to nerves and uh, yeah. and thoughts are things. That's another term we hear about and it's often referred yeah. to those things as um, neurotransmitters which, which um, attach to cells and cause genes to express themselves in a certain way. But thoughts are also neurons and nervousness. So this memory, muscle memory, soft tissue memory, thoughts of things, um, you know, it kind of makes sense and it's a way of very powerful. I've seen, I've seen the technique and I've been very impressed with its power. But I also, you know, I, I, there's another thing that I've heard and that is never ask a question you don't want to hear the answer to. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I mean, in some sense, this is a very powerful tool um, you know, as you are unpeeling, uncovering a whole range of things, do you find yourself clinically in a situation where, oh, hang on, this is perhaps going a little, you know, we're getting into dangerous territory here, which we may not be able to resolve? What do you say to that? Well, yeah, I think this is really important. And I think anyone who chooses to embark on this as a professional choice Um as a practitioner, you've really got to be willing to do the work on yourself and really go down the rabbit hole of, of you know, how you've uh, created your reality and, and everything that you can to personally evolve. Because firstly, when you're doing muscle testing, you tend to find things, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a team kind of... Uh, well, I guess the way, the way it works is that the... the you will find what you have the capability of dealing with. It tends to be what comes up. You know, if it's outside of your, as a practitioner, if it's outside of your potential reality, that person doesn't seem to let that part out of themselves. You know, <laughs> there's, this, there's definitely this, you know, underlying innate intelligence to the system, you know, which is a guiding principle, which is, hard to understand but i guess it comes down to really more in the realm of quantum physics and mm. and how we form realities you know um of the different potentials that that can be and um but what i what I, but it, so i think you really have to be willing to to be able to deal with whatever comes up and certainly if it gets out of your scope of practice make sure before you even embark on this you have a you have a network of people yeah. you know, who i consider my a team who um, I can send people to immediately who, when it's outside my scope, or I know they're going to need more work around something. Yeah. Because, you know, absolutely. When, like, I'll give you an example of this is just a day at the office this week. I had a, um, so my new patient this week was a 14 year old um, girl who was um, 
you know, recent, she recently just, well, in fact, she came out on Monday from a um, institutionalised situation for an attempted suicide. Yeah. And um, and she was 14 years old and her, um, her mum brought her in and and she, you know, she was a... Um, and she was well presented. She was an attractive young girl, um, and she was at a you know at a at a private school. And um, but she was just unraveling socially. And had been like she was good until year seven, and then just a few things happened in year seven and eight, and she um, had fallen apart and then attempted her life. And uh, and so, you know, you're not, and then she was, she was cutting and she had her arms were all bandaged up. Um, uh, and so, yeah, so then we, we went through the workup with her. And so a workup in that sort of case is looking at, you know, those key developmental things in her life and then what's happening at a, at a gut and digestive system level because of the ways in which the gut inflammation affects the brain. Um, and it turned out, you know, she had some pretty clear um, sensitivities to certain foods because she, you know, and again, we're using muscle testing initially to, to look at that, but we'll then quantify that with things like a food inflammatory test, like an IgG type panel that we'll do to, to correlate things. So muscle testing is a good way of screening, but you can't quantify anything. So you, we use other pathology to to follow up and confirm, like everything in you know, as you would in dentistry and and a lot of the medical things. Like one one test in and of itself is not necessarily you can't go off that. You need mm-hmm. to put it together with other things. So kinesiology is definitely like that. It's not a be all and end all. It's not absolute truth. It's just a guidepost of the direction you're on. Um, because it, you know there is a degree of subjectivity in it, and it's um, and you need to to just account for that. Um, but yeah, in, in, a, in a case like this, we sort of looked at that sort of stuff, and then we looked at her her reflex pattern around serotonin. So there's body reflexes that relate to serotonin, and um, and you can use them to see what how the body's um, yeah body's ability to to form these things, and and um, so in, in her case. We looked at the serotonin reflexes showed up and we looked at that it had a really strong emotional driver. So there's a, another thing you correlate with as, as a muscle test to see if it's emotional. So because it could be nutritional, it could be gut inflammation, it could be a microbiome issue. But with her, it was um, it could be heavy metals, but it was it seemed to be primarily emotional. And when we looked at what that was, that came up. Um, and, you know, here's where this whole ability to, to be willing – to allow it to go wherever it goes and to frame it correctly to the patient and to the person in the room, which is her mum, because when this came up, it came up around a topic that really related a lot to her mum. And um, and so luckily they'd been through a lot of intensive psychological work, so it wasn't new to them, otherwise I would never have done this. But given their level of understanding where they're up to, we're sort of like, okay, let's are you okay if we open this up and have a look at what underpins this at the moment? Um, and when we got into it, it was that um, that she was really attracted to um, a, another girl in her in her year who was uh, um, another fourteen year old girl, and she was attracted to her. And then she'd approached her and and had been rejected, and it tied into all this other rejection she was getting, um, and. And as we sort of chunked up as to what that was, it was that she was really looking for intimate connection um, with a female, you know? And when you look at that at a higher level, you go, okay, so we just generalize that. Now let's go back to the original time or event in which there was frustration at, at an inability to connect and feel intimate with a, with a female. And that indexed for time back to her first month of life. And when we looked at what that was, then that was um, uh, she was an elective Caesar. Um, her mum couldn't breastfeed, had a lot of trouble with that. She had reflux. When they gave her a bottle, she was in a lot of pain. So she was crying. Her mum was overwhelmed with that and wanted just to give her away. In her mum's words, I just wanted to give her away. Oh, my God. So, yeah. You can see the pattern here, right? So, I can, I can, and this is a good example of opening a can right? of worms. And this is, yeah, you know, and, and so this patient presents at 14 
with a projected infatuation with a female because she's craving intimacy. Now, if you crave something, you push it away, right? So she's she's not you know not going to resolve it in that way. But but she had this craving for that. But really, what it was was this unresolved childhood pattern of lack of intimate contact initially in her life. Mm. And she also was on SOMAC now, which was to deal with her her as she went through the suicidal episode, it was it became apparent that she had chronic reflux again. Mm. Interesting, you know, because that also correlated with that time of her life. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, if you start to give SOMAC a lot, you affect your body's ability to break down its proteins and therefore you don't produce enough tryptophan to get your serotonin back on track. So that's another story. But um, but yeah, but anyway, so we when we got to that and all the emotions that came up for her at that time, like she absolutely lit the room up. Like she was kind of just kind of dealing with the feelings coming up at that time, which were things like anger, frustration, rage at not being able to get what she needed. Um, and so she just was sweating and, and so much heat came out of her body. It was incredible, you know? Um, and, and then we were able to sort of just, you know, break that down with her mom to say, you know, this is not about blame. Everyone's doing their absolute best, but this is when needs aren't met in life, which happens all the time. And, all sorts of ways, but it's about gaining understanding because when we understand each other, we can heal and we can look at what we actually need and what we need now. And then I had to walk out of the room to get um, a supplement for her and I came back in and they were hugging. Hmm. I went, wow, that was, that's the perfect finish to that particular intervention. And her mum said, yeah, but she never wants to hug me. You know, mm-hmm. and um, and because she's been holding on to that rage ever since she was a month old, right? Wow. Um, and so that that's where the healing work begins, right? So mm-hmm. now we can start to heal the energy between those two, um, and I think you know that that'll be the solution for her. So you know, with and the the thing with muscle testing and your know, emotional technique, that all came up in ten minutes. You know, we're into that stuff so quick, um, and then it. You know, that's where you, you need to have a good grounding in other sort of um, other areas uh, of, of study and, and understanding of psychology so you can you can work with those sort of things at, at that point in time. So, But even if you are doing that with just a process of NET, just the system of just bringing it up and allowing the energy to be released and then referring that on to a psychologist at that point with that sort of background really helps mm. that person as well. Mm. So, yeah, that's how that technique works. And that's kind of like, a, that's a day in the office of a slightly more complex case, but that's what, unfortunately, these days what I see a lot of. And um, and certainly last year I did a little pilot study at Cranbrook School as well. And, and that was, again, what I was seeing a lot of, which was just disconnected kids um, going through complex life situations and really not having the, the capacity to, to handle it, you know, so sort of checking out or attempting to check out, which is terrifying and um, and completely unnecessary when you start to understand what's really going on below it and uh, and, uh, and and how to heal that. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that's a really good example of above, down, and inside out. That's um, that's uh, that's quite a story there, uh, Matt. Um, listen, I know your passion. I know your passion. You're passionate about empowering people. Um, tell us a little about, you know, the science of feeling amazing, you know, tell us how, yeah. uh, tell us about that. What are some of the prerequisites? <laughs> well, I guess, you know, as you would be aware too, when you start to work in as, at a more holistic level, you've got to be able to hold a lot on the screen of your mind, right? You've really, you can't oversimplify things and have a cookie cutter approach to clinical practice. You've really got to be willing to handle whatever you know, all the complexity that there is out there, you know, which is a lot and it's constantly evolving. There's a lot to learn. So that can be a little bit stressful for yourself. And, um, and in that, I've sort of from that looked at, well, what are the things that you need in life to, to manage that, to feel consistently good each day, to, to really have the energy, the resources, the resilience and just the mindset to manage life, which changes through all the different chapters you go through, you know, being in my, kind of second half of my 40s now and with kids getting older it's it's a you know it's a really interesting time to you know where you've got to have mastery over different things and that increasing complexity of life so 
I guess really looking at the science of feeling amazing is about looking at where you're at in that stage of life and what are the physiological requirements that you have and based on the energy output and the kind of things you do and the things you love and how to set up your lifestyle where you take time to to curate things, you know, to create habits that just innately embed those things in, you know, because it really it always comes down to just daily habits and routine and, you know, you can never be disciplined with something for very long, but if you embed one thing at a time and keep putting layer upon layer of good habits in place, then, um, you know, you can find yourself in a, in a much better place. So we really focus on that with people, which is not to try and say that there's a one-size-fits-all approach to this, but to meet them where they're at look at what their next step is, embed that, and then add the next thing in and then the next thing. So someone might start, yeah, there might be a pretty physical thing, you know. They need to, um, you know, improve their their core. They need to work on some stability exercises and they need to, there's an adjustment sequence we might be doing with them in order to retrain a pattern they've been in. But once they've got that under control, it's like, well, look, now that chronic back pain, it's 70% better. But really, this is actually exacerbated by some gut inflammation. And that's, you know, we might want to reduce the grain in your diet or take these different foods out that are a bit pro-inflammatory in you and and start to refine that. And now it's kind of 90% better, you know, and going really well. And and then you're like, well, that last 10%, what, what's that? And that may be that, that shift that they need to make um, emotionally about moving into this higher level of purpose with what they're doing and um, and a higher level of success that they're creating in some area, you know, because that um, area often relates to insecurity or financial stress and, you know, and that sort of thing. So, you know, you start to refine that with them and look at what that is and, and take them on that journey. So, um, yeah, the, it's, it's around those sort of principles and looking at the, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's physical elements you need to address. There's emotional elements that we need to address. There's toxicity elements these days that we always need to address. Um, and then, uh, and, and then there's a, you know, there's a spiritual quest that we're all kind of on, whether we like it or not. So it's just um, helping people become aware of that based on where they're up to in their journey. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love it. That's uh, that's great. Um, now, listen, we've covered some great territory here and we've given people a lot of food for thought. And I wondered if we might just, before we finish, just take a step back here from your role as, uh, you know, in, in healthcare, and because we're all on this journey together, uh, you know, in life, we're all on a journey. What do you think the biggest challenge is for us on our journey through life in our modern world today? The biggest challenge. Um, wow. I think the, that's a big question, really. But I guess the the, the biggest challenge is, you know, is, is living our truth in this world of complexity that we've created for ourselves. In, in um, and you know, it's it's because as we get drawn into these, I guess. When I look at it, where we're at now, we're at now we're this place where we're so connected and we're so we've got so much information coming at us that we don't exactly live in a culture that's enlightened, right? We live in a culture that's materialist, competitive, um, and you know we look at the planetary challenges now, and we're not really going in a direction that's going to save them, you know, and resolve it, um, you know, if we keep on that path and. So I guess the key challenge for people is to realize that if they don't take the time to cultivate their own culture, really be clear on their own values, and then set up their habits and their daily routines that reflect those things, you know, because what people do these days is they roll over, they turn their phone on, and they start flicking through Instagram and Facebook and this onslaught of information that either makes them jealous, envious, insecure, <laughs> or want more than they have, um, you know, and they get dragged into everyone else's reality and in, before they've even taken the time to acknowledge where they're at and what they're grateful for and 
what's important to them, you know. So, you know, I think people these days have really got a, you know, it's a challenge to to embed yourself in in what's in the in your core values and really take the time to know what they are and what they are for your family, so that you you're not dragged off in all these different influences that happen to us, you know, uh, that really uh, don't have our best interest at heart. You know, they're really are designed around creating success for, for others in many cases, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, people need to be conscious of that, you know, and, and have the self-awareness to unplug themselves a little bit and certainly take the time to, to and, you know, settle into themselves and know what they need and before they go about connecting at that level. Matthew, what a great note to finish on and thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your journey, your wisdom, your experience. Um, it's been terrific. No, thank you, Ron. Well, there is a lot there to take in. Now, for the last 40 years in my practice, I've been very interested in chronic musculoskeletal pain, conditions like chronic tension, headaches, neck aches, and jaw aches. An important point that is often overlooked in chronic pain problems is this. Muscles have memory and, importantly, are capable of maintaining an inflammation long after the initiating or triggering event has occurred. That memory can go on for years, 5, 10, 20, 30 years, or even a lifetime. So often, in my experience, people in chronic muscle pain have had X-rays taken, MRIs, CAT scans, they see a doctors, they see many doctors, neurologists, and sometimes they're told, there's nothing wrong with you. We can't find a problem. Well, here's the thing. Muscle and nerve memory does not show up like that. But that doesn't mean it's not vitally important with dealing with the problem, in dealing with the problems, and often addressing the cause along the way. That's been part of my approach to these problems for many years, so it was really interesting to hear Matthew approach this from a slightly different direction. We will, of course, have links to Matthew's website, Optimal Healing Essentials, and we'll be exploring this mind, body, muscle and nerve memory approach in the months ahead. I'm actually writing a book on it. Now, don't forget to download the Unstress app at the App Store or Google Play and just keep in touch, keep up to date with the latest episodes, blogs, and events and courses. And of course, leave that review on iTunes and help us get the message out to many more people. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner.